Welcome to Inside College Admission, conversations with admission leaders and matters affecting the college going process. My name is Peter Van Buskirk, and I am joined today by Fumio Sugahara, Dean of Admission and Financial Aid at Hampshire College. Welcome, Fumio. Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad to be able to talk with you. Uh, Fumio and I go way back uh, in terms <laughs> of our, our shared admission experiences, uh, and it, it's good to, to be able to talk with you about things going on right now in the age of coronavirus. And, and your situation is, is fairly unique, isn't it? I mean, you joined the Hampshire staff uh, in the middle of March or so, so you kind of parachuted into the middle of, of uh, a situation that was very dynamic. Yeah, and it was... Uh... You know, I've been to, I've been to Hampshire twice, um, once to interview, and once when I, I, I just felt like I wanted my wife and son to see the campus, and we drove down, and so my, my entire experience since then has been virtual, you know, and that, you know, means meeting with the staff of about 16 people, um, senior team meetings, uh, daily um, you know, everything that has to happen to move an operation forward has been virtual. Um, you know, talking with organizations about name buys, I mean, to, to, to trying to develop publications, things that we're so used to sitting down with, uh, a, you know, a colleague or um, a specialist in an area or a consultant, and it's all happening in this virtual space. Um, so yeah, it, it's been a really interesting uh, transition uh, to, to go through. Well, and, and Hampshire is a relative newcomer among colleges and universities, founded in what, the mid-1970s or so, um, and uh, it, it has a, a rather interesting uh, orientation to, to higher education. What was the draw for you when, when you had the opportunity to uh, consider the position? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a great, it's a really interesting time for Hampshire. This is, this will be its fiftieth year. Wow. Um, yeah, and so it is. It's, it's really a newcomer, and the, the history of Hampshire is similarly unique. It was the, the other four colleges, um, UMass, Amherst, um, Amherst College, Mount Holyoke, and Smith. Um, those presidents came together to create a college that would um, innovate and be a transformative leader in the higher ed landscape. And, and Hampshire, that's, that's what Hampshire is. And that's the approach that it's had. And so to be a part of a place that is really trying to um, not just do higher ed differently, but find ways to do it better and to um, and to, to 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 spread that like things that we talk about now every day like experiential learning the, these are things that Hampshire was doing and we're saying hey like give this a look or you know take a look at this and um, and and so it's 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 a really interesting environment to be at a place where the expectation is to to try to do new things in the higher ed landscape which you and i both know is um is 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 terrain that that does anything in its power to not change um so so for me you know that was a part of it it's just this the the idea the, the big idea that's hampshire um it is 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 so powerful um but also you know the, there's the simple things you know like leadership Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to be able to work with a president who, there are all sorts of presidents, and, and I, I definitely graduate, uh, gravitate towards the visionary presidents, and, um, mm -hmm. and then there, there, Hampshire has real challenges. I mean, this is a college that, um, you know, we have, a, we have an endowment, but it's not as big as other institutions. We're definitely tuition dependent, like 90% um, of the colleges in this country. Right. Um, in in a market where where small colleges are 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 really in a lot of ways having to validate themselves and what they bring um, to the market and to the students in ways that didn't exist ten years ago. So you know, for me, Hampshire is also different because we talk a different language sometimes. You know, students say, "Wait, no majors." Um, they say, "No departments," like and. 
you know, and so not only are we dealing with the challenges of a small liberal arts college in, in New England with the demographic shifts and the market shifts, but also in a lot of ways, we're talking a different language. And so for me, those challenges culminate into a, an exciting terrain. And I've, I mean, you know me, I've never shied away from a, <laughs> from a good higher ed challenge. <laughs> and that's, that's for sure. And, and now, uh, in, in light of what's going on with the health crisis and the economic crisis, it would seem that perhaps Hampshire's DNA positions it rather uniquely to grapple with these challenges. Uh, what are you experiencing now that you've uh, uh, become immersed in, in the leadership group, uh, looking at uh, um, enrollment uh, challenges uh, immediate and into the future? Well, and, and we, we do, this does require some context because I, you know, uh, a year ago, um, Hampshire was under very different leadership and had determined to not take a class mm. um, as they tried to figure out what was the best path forward to financial sustainability. Um, and so what's been really the, the most interesting challenge is that um, our historic benchmark data is, is very hard to, to track. If you, you don't take a class, you throw a lot of things out of whack. Um, and so even though the board and the new leadership and, I mean, you know, our students rallied and locked themselves in the president's office, I mean, <laughs> they made the point that this education is important and it must be around, and we've taken up that challenge, we're still building our way back up. And um, we're in the midst of a $60 million campaign. We've generated, I think, over 13 million of that already. It's a five-year. Um, and so, so there's a lot of, you throw in the, the COVID-19 on top of all of these other pieces um, that are happening. What's, what's, what's been the, for me, the most, uh, the biggest challenge is that we're, we're completely blind. You know, the, the data points that you fall back on um, that you would use to say, okay, we're here relative to this, or under these circumstances, we can expect this behavior. They, they really don't exist anymore. Um, and that's been, that's, I think, what a lot of us in the field are experiencing is that it's one thing to have, um, you know, I say this now, like it's one thing to have a demographic downturn. Right. The, the demographic shift has been happening for, for 25 years. Mm -hmm. we, we all saw it coming. Whether or not higher ed or institutions decided to respond was one thing, but it, it, it was still massive sure. um, in its implications for higher ed. But the global pandemic is, is something beyond even that. There was no telegraphing of this. There was no preparation. I mean, places that even had um, you know, I remember at um, one of the college, a, a college I worked in the West Coast, we, we talked about pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we had our plans, but, but that was how it impacts the campus. Right. But what happens when it stops the world? <laughs> right? Exactly. Well, it, it seems like then uh, you're at, at Hampshire, you're not only building the plane while it's in the air, but you're doing it without an instrument panel, which uh, has got a present its, its own uh, unique set of challenges. Now, I, you said that you had elected or the college had elected at one point not to take on a class, but I believe now that you are in the oh, midst yeah. of enrolling a class. Um, how is that going for you so far? You know, what I've come to say, and I, I don't, I'm not dodging the question, no, but, you're <laughs> but, but what, I, what I've come to say is that, you know, I, I, I look at the numbers daily and are, we're doing a lot of outreach and I'm talking to a lot of families um, and we, we did extend our, we did extend our deadline to June 1st um, and we're being really flexible. Um, we are seeing, you know, I have seen maybe, a, I mean, at Hampshire we're so small, but you know, we, we've had about four or five defers so far and I do expect that number to go up. Um, but so far, what's been the most interesting is that I can't see any evidence to say we're not going to meet our target. Good. 
Good. Right. Like the, like, and, and the, the problem is, is that, you know, I'm looking at last year and which was zero, like there was nothing last year. And then, well, there were like 15 students last year. And then we're looking at um, the, the previous two years. And those years we had a target of 350, whereas this year, because we're a buildup, we have a target of 150. So the, you know, there's so many things that line, but um, what I'm most excited about is that there's this, there still is a really positive tenor um, when I, when I talk with families and as my staff engages people, like, you know, I think what, what's, what's encouraging is that people still do see a lot of value and, and to something that going, maybe going virtual, um, a lot of students are realizing, yeah, actually, you know, I can see a place for online learning and virtual learning, and I can maybe see a place in my future, but for for these four years, I, I want the collegiate experience. And, and and to some extent, so they're not saying I'm walking away. Right. They're saying maybe I'll take a gap year and I'll do something while the while while things settle down. Um, but they're but in 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 an odd way, I've been have a sense of almost a reaffirmation that that this education is important. It's kind of like we we took it it was forced, it was taken away. And in that retrospect, in that moment, people are saying, oh yeah, that's right. That thing, that higher ed thing ha has value, that, that classroom, that professor experience, that, um, so, so no evidence to see, to see us not making that 150, um, you know, whereas at other institutions, you, you see, you, you can see evidence, you can see a tenor, you talk to families and they're, they're pointing to the things that are um, exogenous or you're seeing a huge blip in financial aid requests or, or appeals. So, so there are things that you can key into that say, okay, we need to adjust. Um, and we've just been really, um, you know, we've just tried to stay ahead. Like we, we already, um, I know places are, um, are now re-releasing financial aid awards. We were we just said, hey, we're typically a lower discounting college anyway. So we've we've been one of the few colleges to keep that discount rate below the 60% threshold. Um, and we just said, you know what? Our families are gonna need this. Mm -hmm. Like this is this is a time if we're gonna put the money down, this is the time to do it. One, because we want to make sure that we maintain our yield. We need to build up that class, but also families need it more. 52, there's a, I think I saw a survey data that 52% of the students who were surveyed, uh, a parent had lost their job as really as, as due to COVID-19. And the problem is that's not going to show up on the FAFSA. Um, you know, and so there's going to be, there's a, there's going to be a lag mm -hmm. between when we act, the financials actually catch up. To the individual, and 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 we have to start thinking about that. Now, it, you indicated that you've extended your enrollment deadline till June first, but it, it and it sounds like not only in talking with you but others, the the whole enrollment process may not settle in a concrete way until close to September first, uh, as as folks are continuing to try to uh, firm up their financial situations. Um, of course, the Department of Justice has made it possible for the uh, the for, for families to to kind of shop around now and for colleges to re-recruit kids who may have committed somewhere else. How do you see that affecting uh, Hampshire, if at all? You know, that that's a good question. Um, the 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 hard thing is that. And maybe I take a different take on it is that there there have actually always been highly aggressive players mm -hmm. in the admission field um, and 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 they haven't necessarily applied the standards of good practice the the NACAC standards um, and 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 NACAC as a government body doesn't necessarily have the the means of actually curtailing that behavior. Um, you know, and so, so it's, 
so to be honest with ourselves, you know, which I think is important, we should acknowledge that actually this has been going on. Right. Um, and so the, the, the Justice Department took down walls and, and I, I and again, I, I don't, I'm not supportive of this. And I think I, I'm surrounded in general by peers and colleagues who have a high ethical standard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, 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 and we understand that, you know, introducing that kind of instability and that kind of um, behavior uh, is not in the best interest of students. And, and, and so in that way, we're, we're tightly aligned with the NACAC principles in philosophy, but more important in our actions. Um, and so, but we do need to say, there have always been players who've, who, for whatever reason, have operated in a very aggressive fashion that has been outside the boundaries of NACAC. I mean, actually, outside the boundaries of NCAA, you know, like, I mean, I, and, and so, um, and we, we do need to be honest with ourselves that that has existed. And, you know, the other thing is that I, I, I agree for some places they're going to be operating through to September, but it's a little, I would say for the past five years, because of the demographic downturn and because of the decrease in enrollments um, across the small college section that, you know, for, for me, that's not new. Like we've been operating off of, um, transfer pools and waitlist groups that have gone well into um, well beyond July uh, mm -hmm. when most of us hope to not and so so you know those real pressures I think have been exacerbated mm -hmm. but by and large the the non the the places outside of this hyper selective colleges we we've we've always been operating <laughs> well into the summer <laughs> Right. And by, by the way, you, you referenced NACAC, and for those listening, uh, that would be the National Association of College Admission Counseling, the, the, the membership organization that, that many, but not all, of colleges and universities uh, yes. uh, belong to and adhere to a, a standard of principles of good practice. Um, Fumio, tell me what it's like now trying to secure the class, if you will. Students have been admitted to the class of 2024. Um, I believe that's the right one. And uh, yeah. uh, th so that they've gotten the good news. And normally the month of, of April is a celebration time. You want them on your campus. You want to show them around, have them get close with faculty, you know, uh, feel like, yeah, this is my place. I really want to be here. How is that working now? And you, you've given that whole process an extra month, but, but how are you reaching those students you've admitted and, and uh, helping them to feel comfortable with their decision? Yeah, well, and and really, the 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 pro the thing is that it's it. I so wish it could be a celebratory conversation, but it's really about it's it's a practical conversation, and and we're talking about safety, and we're talking about security, and we're we're saying what is our response, and um, you know we're paying attention like is there a hot spot near me and you know what we have that there and and we're at we're we're confined by factors that we have no control of if if the governor of massachusetts maintains a stay-at-home order there's not much we can do but if most of our students are from new york new york and new york maintains stay at home well that's what do we do about that and and uh, you know so it's not even we're, we're trying to build all the connectivity and we're trying to foster those conversations, but we're also having to, you know, for us, there's a, there's a sobriety mm -hmm. of the conversation, which is um, we're much more used to being more enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as you saying, making those connections and here we're, we're, we're consoling in a time of celebration. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're saying it's going to be all right. We're going to be here. We're going to we we're going to make sure we have masks. And you know, Hampshire's really lucky. We're we have 600 students. We're on 800 acres. Everybody lives in singles. Um, you know, like plenty of space. Yeah, we got space, and we're fortunate that we're 
we are able to associate with UMass Medical, mm -hmm. and they're going to ramp up their testing. I mean, but but think about it. That's the conversation we're having, um, and that's the conversation that students and families want to have. Um, and I worry that we're losing sight of the the real uh, the real meat of the the the, the issue is that this is your education. Right. Um, so, but also translating the that that feel like it, it's one thing to have students to have the big admitted student day with that big celebratory feel mm -hmm. and have our faculty there and our current students and our future students and and to have that synergy um you know that's i mean again that that celebratory atmosphere um and it's really it's really difficult to create that um in in a virtual space and so what we've been doing is really because we're so small is trying to say, well, let's act small. You know, like, like what, what does that mean? So that, that really means getting our faculty out there, scheduling Zoom meetings, like our faculty are calling and emailing students right now. Um, you know, we have our res life and our, we have the farm. I, if you if you want to see really cute pictures, there's a, a baby cow at the farm. There's a calf at the farm right now, so you can go to Instagram. So, you know, I mean, we we are putting those things forward um, and using social media, using Zoom, um, you know, Facebook Live, using video content to to not to just also mix it up because there is a fatigue with the Zoom sessions are these video conferences mm -hmm. um so we're, we're just trying to really step up the per, the, the personal not mm -hmm. personalized to the, the personal just talk to someone talk to one of us meet a student meet a faculty those are things that we at hampshire can do really well and that's how we've embraced doing this um but it it definitely doesn't have that synergistic atmosphere of that that big admitted student day the, the irony though is that it, it, because of the adjustments you've had to make in your outreach you're presenting perhaps even more high touch opportunities albeit not literally in person for these young people and their parents to, to have conversations with your students and, and and faculty i think so i think that from i you know, I can't speak for the faculty because I, you know, as I said, pedagogically, I think students are looking at this and saying, wow, I really, I'm excited to get back to the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, but from an operational and a marketing perspective, I think we're learning a lot from this. Um, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if in the future, a lot of what we're doing today students should expect to still see mm -hmm. um, as well as the admitted student day as well as these other options right like because you know i think we higher ed pivoted really fast faster than i thought we would <laughs> i agree right and and so now we we spun so fast that our heads were spinning but then we're like wait we actually spun. <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> and 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 so I'm 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 really curious to see what it is that we're going to learn and carry forward from this, not just simply the fact that we responded, but that we learned and that not only learned we adapted, and we adapted to a new way of communicating and conveying the higher ed experience. And and also we we will learn from our failures. Sure. Um, there have been a lot of things that didn't work. A lot of conversations were like, you know, like, no, you can't put that person on a Zoom meeting. <laughs> and, you know, and, and so we're, we have to learn those things and make those, those, those choices about what that atmosphere looks like and what and how, to, um, and how to craft it in a way that's genuine and engaging. So, so it sounds like out of necessity, you you're developing sort of a, a parallel uh, outreach uh, platform, if you will. I mean, you, you'd love to have everybody on campus doing things synergistically the way you've always done it. But if you can't do that, then there's got to be a plan B ready for the start of school in the fall as well. And yeah. um, the, as you suggest, it may be that we're learning an awful lot about what plan B could add to in a positive way 
the way it used to be. So, but now let, let's transition just a little bit to the, um, the next class, the, the students mm -hmm. who are rising high school seniors uh, who are probably banging at the gates as well, trying to figure out uh, what's this place all about and uh, you know, should I add a Hampshire to my list? How are you, how are you working with your team on uh, uh, recruiting, if you will, the, the, the next class after the one that you enrolled this fall? Um, you know, honestly, Peter, that, that's, I mean, I've, I've, I've been here about four months, four weeks. <laughs> oh, come on, you can do this. <laughs> and, uh, you, have and, and your, you have a big ass on your chest, don't you? Yeah. And so we, and, and a lot of it has been damage control in relation to COVID-19. Sure. Um, and, um, there was a wonderful, had a wonderful interim dean, but um, but we we also I think because they knew the transition and and also um, I, I was kind of hired out of the blue um, and so they didn't the, the staff didn't expect me to be there so then you know the we uh, this very quick interview process and I met folks and next thing you know I'm I'm literally working for Hampshire you're still getting uh, to know each other I understand yeah and. Um, but what I'm, what we're really focusing on is messaging out a new curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, we did, the, Ed Wingenbach, our president, I think keenly observed when he started uh, about a year ago, um, it, we have this college that has this incredible mission um, to innovate and to impact higher education with, with new practices. And 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 he asked them, you know, very simple but important question, like, well, how have we done that recently? <laughs> and 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 I think with a lot of deep um, introspection, uh, you know, they they actually have created a a, a newer a new curriculum. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's still the fabric of Hampshire, mm -hmm. but it um, it definitely brings in best practices in terms of first year seminars. And it, it, um, it allows the students to really think about big questions um, within the context of advisory. Um, it will culminate in a, a large project that the students um, undertake. Um, and again, in, in the absence of departments and majors, um, they they still have to forge this education, and, and I just I, I personally believe that um, the confidence that that these students build when they do that is, is so important. But we have to get the word out about the curriculum and the changes to the curriculum um, again in a way to to a population that's not used to people talking like this. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really you know, for me, that's really important. And, and, and I'm, I'm kind of a, I, I might be a little bit of a purist in that I, I think I don't like using proxy language. Um, a lot of places that don't have majors, um, they will say it's like a major. Right. And, and I, I really, I think that's a disservice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, no, you don't have to say it's like a major. You don't even have to reference a major, but you do have to say, you have to say, if, if you're not going to provide that, we do need to be clear, this is our approach to the liberal arts and to your bachelor's of arts degree, and this is what it will look like. We have to be able to succinctly articulate that. Um, and and that's that's what we're working on. That That's the language we're working on right now. And that's, you know, saying I'm going to talk with our uh, a publications firm and a marketing firm later, but, um, so those things, but I'm also trying to make, have the operation be, um, I, I think small colleges, they sometimes think that they're too small to be data oriented. Hmm. Uh, and I, I think that's again, a, another mistake. Um, and we certainly never want to reduce a student to a data point. Um, but in the in the environment where so much is happening in the um, the electronic space, the online space, um, we have to really be good stewards of 
our information and how we as an institution interpret the market um, and use that to, you, to, to, to manage our resources well, which are finite, um, to make the best decisions towards bringing a class. And, and so that's the other thing is really trying to be a small college with a, a strong data orientation from goals, um, from goals for counselors to four-year retention for students. Um, and given the messaging that, that you're describing now that is highly nuanced, uh, I would imagine that in, in a normal cycle, you'd take advantage of opportunities to, to talk with high school counselors and students in schools, do the college fairs, have the open houses on campus, you know, and, and a, hopefully the world becomes a little more perfect and you can, you can re-engage like that in the fall. But absent that sort of routine, what, what does that roadmap look for, like for you right now? Um, well, right now, for, for me, it, it looks like um, it, it does look like we'll be doing a lot more virtual and we'll be doing, we'll probably create very specific spaces for counselors mm -hmm. um, where we can have conversations, not just, well, and, and, and I think we should recognize that, you know, public school counselors, private school counselors, independent counselors and, and advisors at community-based organizations, those four groups have, have very different realities mm -hmm. and questions when it comes down to higher education. And, and I mean, you and I, we, we've talked about this, but I feel like it, it's, it's kind of ridiculous that we set one group aside, like the independent counselors and don't have conversations. Um, and, but, but I think we, we do need to figure out where is a forum that we can have these conversations with these four groups um, and, and probably not together, mm -hmm. you know, probably not have these big, conversations where um, where you have a CBO and you have like a, a, a wealthy private secondary school and and they're talking past each other and you can't really address their realities mm -hmm. and so I think there's an opportunity in here to, for us to have more honest conversations through a virtual space to specific groups of counselors who actually really do need different things from us Mm -hmm. um, and then we can we can figure out how to bring those messages back to the broader to if we need to to a broader group. But um, so I think that's a, an opportunity waiting for us to 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 to, to manifest. Um, and then the other is we just we have to step up our ability to show our campus in a virtual space. Um, you know because no one intends for us to never be on campus no because if, if that's the case then like those changes are so far beyond right. um beyond us so we have to figure out ways of better conveying to campus and um and then the last is that i think and and this is a lesson that i think we could probably learn from uh, an, an organization like um southern new hampshire university mm -hmm. um is that Online classes or virtual classes aren't classroom classes that have been moved online, right? And right. and they're very clear about that. Um, and we probably need to do education within our organizations or our institutions mm -hmm. about what it really does means to be in a longer terrain conversation or longer ter terrain existence like let's say through January, mm -hmm. where we are really in that virtual space and how are we gonna adapt to pedagogy to not just be moving our classrooms into the virtual space. Like we, like, you know, if this is gonna go longer, we need to really rethink the pedagogy um, in that temporary space. Um, and, and I, you know, I would expect a place like Hampshire, that's what we're supposed to do. Right. You know, like it's kind of, for me, this is, this is a challenge that is that we're well equipped for. <laughs> well, and, and, and it becomes a complex message then for the students and the parents 
who are trying to figure out how to approach uh, decision making about colleges. Am I am I considering a place where I'm certain to be on campus, possibly on campus, definitely not on campus, but we could return. Uh, and I think that the the whole set of filters that that young people have to take on now as they look at colleges is pretty dramatically changed too. Well, and it's it's. And it's, I mean, it's, it's going to be a lot more complicated. Like, I mean, you, you know, we, what about immunocompromised faculty or students, you know, like, even if, even if we do get to um, January, but there's no vaccine, you, you still have individuals who are at such high risk. What, what do we do? And, and, and we have the responsibility of uh, educating every individual to the best of our ability and and so in that model in that instance then what is what are these hybrid models mm -hmm. that we have to give consideration to um so so yeah it's 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 complex and 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 that's the other thing is you know so one thing is to do this all and to put this in place the other thing is how do we use these exam as examples in the market as our approach to, to to teaching and learning and experiential learning, mm -hmm. um, you know, ha, ha, we have to then also make sure that we can translate this and display and translate this into um, the the collegiate expectation that that these families have, and that's um, and again, that's also a pretty heavy lift, and it's and and we're not you know higher ed, we're not quite there yet. Yeah. Well, it, it I'd like to kind of pivot a little bit right now to, to some of the other concerns that prospective students, next year's mm -hmm. seniors, uh, have as they, they think of the process. And I think top of mind for many is the question of testing. Um, of course, the College Board and the ACT have canceled tests uh, into uh, through the early part of the summer. And I guess there's some hope that there will be, uh, you know, in-person testing in the fall, if not that, some online testing. Uh, how will that um, affect candidates at, at Hampshire? The, the whole testing question. It it won't. Okay. Um, we we actually uh, we're not we we're beyond test option. <laughs> we're we're test blind. Good. Um, we we were actually one of the first. Um, I th think Sarah Lawrence was the first, and then and then but 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 we have um, we've been test blind. Um, but as a so so it it won't Im impact. If if anything, I think it will be. My my hope is that it'll be better for students. I'm not. Um, I, I actually have some really big worries about. You know, it's kind of funny coming from most of the colleges I've been at have been test optional. <laughs> right. Um, but but um, but the problem is is that uh, in terms of retention and graduation, the combo of the SAT or ACT with the GPA is a is a really powerful indicator and you know one thing the college board has done well has been their validation studies of gpa relative to test scores and we take that off we take that off the table and there's a really you, you lose a really big resource um, in terms of understanding the the ability for the students graduating a cohort uh, to succeed in a four-year institution, so it, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to ever say we should require testing or bring back testing, but I do want to note that it's, it is troublesome, the current terrain that ACT and College Board have brought themselves into by moving uh, to these all tests, and and that that. And I, I agree with NACAC for calling the College Board out for not seeking deeper consultation on that decision. Um, so, but, but, you know, I'm concerned for at a, at a larger higher ed level for what it means to, 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 to see the um, ACT and SAT not happen in the way that we've traditionally had them. Um, but I also think that this is going to have a lot of people going test optional. We already we already saw before this we saw a wave of highly selective colleges moving to test optional, 
and this is only gonna gonna push that further um and and i guess i i'm not i'm not going to say that you know i i i'm concerned about everything that's going on within the testing industry at the moment yeah well it, it and something you touched on is important here as well to students who are about to become high school seniors uh you indicated that testing with high school classroom performance becomes uh, very helpful as a predictor of success in college. Well, now we've got a bunch of soon to be high school seniors whose junior year looks a mess and it isn't their own fault. I mean, they, they haven't been in a classroom since maybe middle of March and they've had to transition into some kind of online work as well. What kind of reassurance can you offer from the Hampshire point of view that things are going to be okay? Yeah, well, every graduating class has their own different personality. Um, and, and, you know, one thing is, is that I think what we'll probably see in this group is, is an incredible resilience. Um, and we'll see things that really surprise and amaze us coming mm -hmm. out of the, their, their individual and their collective response to COVID-19. And I think we're, we're already seeing that in some of the data, the, the way that they think about the state governments versus federal governments, um, and, and the way that they see themselves operating in a democracy has become much more critical. And so what we'll see is the, is the resilience and we'll see a passion for community um, that that may have been elusive for other cohorts, mm -hmm. um, and um, and so I I think you know every cohort is different and they bring wonderful things, and I would just you know remind them to not lose sight of what it is that this experience brings them. It's it's not just about the grades, mm -hmm. um, you know, like this this moment will define their lives. Um, and, and for some, it will be really hard. Like I, I think mental health will be on the upswing. Um, but then again, as I said, so will resilience, um, creativity, you know, being in your home for 40, for 40 plus days, trying to navigate a virtual space and keep yourself entertained and maybe a, a younger sibling. Um, the, the toughness and durability of dealing with 50% you know, of some of the uh, of families losing their incomes. Um, you know, I think these will manifest in ways that um, will enable them to, to, to be the adaptable student um, that one that, that we at Hampshire so value, um, that student who um, can adapt and creatively sculpt and curate their future. But I also, you know, can imagine that what 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 college wouldn't want <laughs> right. that 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 those students and so so I you know it's hard to see in the immediacy when they're dealing with their grades and their classes and and so much chaos, but it's important to be reminded that the the things you live with and the things that you overcome and the work that you do, it, it, it doesn't always turn out the way you want it. And the circumstances aren't always ideal. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact is, is that they will get through this and they, they will go to college and they will bring those gifts to college. And, 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 and honestly, I'm, I'm really, if there's one thing I'm excited about, that that is uh, a point of, of of enthusiasm and excitement for me. To, to to see how the moment is shaping this particular cohort, uh, which is yeah, I think it's important for kids, and I, I just would reiterate what you're saying for kids maybe to just take a deep breath and and uh, reflect on on what's happening in their, in their lives so that they can project uh, well uh, how how these are def moments are defining who they are and then why, more importantly, why they would fit well into the kind of educational environment that you have to offer. Um, one quick final thought, when we come to the other end of, of this experience with the coronavirus, and I'm sure we will at some point, uh, are we back to business as usual or will there ever be such a thing? No, no, we're, it won't be. The, the, um, 
the the financial losses for colleges will be extreme. Um, I, I'm not it. I mean, of course, it will force some into closure. Um, they were probably going to close anyway. Um, so, so the landscape will different be different just because of the fact that um, some names that we had grown to live with and see won't be there in the future. Um, second is that um, you know places are places are talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in losses to their operations. Um, even well, even institutions that are well endowed, um, all of, a lot of that money that they have is locked up in restricted funds. It's not like they can just go to that bank account. Right. It doesn't work that way. And so even some of our wealthier institutions are going to be under really uh, tight budget constraints for, for quite a bit, quite a bit of time. So the recovery won't, won't be, won't be fast. Um, and then the, the, you know, as I said, the, the other impact is that we probably won't know how to do business after this. I mean, there's going to be, there's going to be so many new things that we're going to, that I, I kind of like my take is, Hey, let's go for it. Let's do these new things. But that's not how a lot of other leaders are going to approach this. And, um, and so making those choices when you have, a total menu of virtual and 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 real, right. <laughs> you know. How do you pick and choose those opportunities that are going to enable you to do work? And then, you know, kind of where I started, um, this is going to a lot of the trend lines that higher ed has been using to anticipate its future will be broken, mm -hmm. and um, and trend lines are different from data points. You know, a trend is multiple years, ideally over over five years and at best 10 years. And to have it broken, like, you know, rendered asunder by this, and then to have on the other side, the total outpack, outcomes of the economics, the already the demographic shift. I mean, th there's no way that... Um, that this is going to be the same higher ed that it was uh, in January of this year. And that, that airplane is still in the air as we build it. You know, we, we set out to teach students right. and educate them. And, you know, I believe we, we, we bring together the best faculty and the best, you know, the best people to do that. And, you know, so I, I hope higher education as a whole rises to this challenge in a way that is um, is fitting of the talent that we've that we've assembled. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well Fumio, thank you for carving out some time in, in your day to, to chat with us a little bit about the, the landscape as you see it right now. Uh, Hampshire is certainly very fortunate to have landed you uh, in a leadership role uh, at a critical time in, in its uh, history. So uh, thank you for sharing your views on on oh, any time all matters higher education and uh, good luck oh, uh, thanks I, uh, is there one final thing is there a, a website or a resource uh, to which you would refer any listeners who'd like to learn a little bit more about what's going on at hampshire oh yeah yeah just um www.hampshire.edu um it's a it's a fun it's a fun website and you'll um you'll actually see our covid response um, and you'll see, um, the, you know, information about the new curriculum. It's all, it's all right there. Excellent. Well, thank you again. Have a great day. And to those who are listening, be safe. And uh, we'll look forward to having some further conversations with deans of admission. Take care, everybody.